alhamdulillah So uh, Dr Saheba we have been discussing the significance of Hajj and how it is very important to increase your understanding of this important pillar of Islam so i've read that there are different types of Hajj so can you elaborate on that yes it is important to understand the rituals why because these rituals also have associations that also shows us the flexibility of our religion like for different people coming from different areas and different thought process and then different level of spirituality so a lot of margin and a lot of space has been given to them so basically there are three categories of uh, this uh, performing hajj like the types of it one is called hajj uh, ifrad in which basically what you do is you only perform the rituals of hajj and you don't even have to take the sacrificial animal with you second is hajj kiran in this is the type of hajj in which uh, the umrah and hajj they are together like uh, pilgrims who go for hajj what they do is first they perform uh, umrah and then they remain in the that status of ihram and till the time of hajj and then they perform hajj and then they are free from all the obligations which are associated with that time frame and um, this is a little difficult task and we also need to remember in this type of hajj kiran it's not like uh, that um, you keep moving around in different places but you stay there and you keep yourself in that state uh, status where you are constantly uh, following those rituals and practices and the list of do's and don'ts third category is hajj tamattu and this is the most common kind in which what people do is pilgrims they make this intention of performing hajj they go to towards that uh, spot uh, they perform umrah then they are out of ihram and then from at the time of those days of hajj that is from the 8th of zilhijjah they again are in ihram and now they perform the rituals which are associated specifically with the time of hajj again in this time people can't do this like you know i go let's say in uh, in the month of uh, uh, three four months ahead of hajj uh, i go there i perform my umrah i come back to my hometown or my country and then after three four months i go for hajj and i call it hajj tamattu no you have to stay within that boundary within uh, that framework and but all those obligation the strict obligations are out so you're performing umrah then you're out of your ihram and then you're going back for your hajj again and again you have to uh, do the sacrifice of animal in that situation right that is very interesting so i wanted to understand that uh, what how can we decide what kind of hajj do we need to perform are there any specifications so if you have this in that problem or if there's something that you're limited on time so you should do this so you've described the three types of hajj so how can we decide which one to perform um as i said earlier that this shows the flexibility of our religion like people who are uh, domesticated over there they're living around that uh, the surrounding area they usually perform this hajj ifrad Uh, that sometimes people in our country they feel like what is this they just come and they do the rituals of hajj and they go back and they said we have done hajj because in our mind the concept is we stay for a longer period of time and then uh, we are also engaging ourselves very heavily into performing tawaf and other rituals constantly throughout i have actually seen some people really exhausting themselves in that uh, the whole process rather than enjoying it i mean like they are always calculating how many times i have done umrah how many times i have uh, performed a tawaf or how many times i have prayed extra nawafil so the the point is that this ibada this ritual has to be something that helps you develop your connection and like you know rejuvenate yourself develop that spiritual uh, bonding make it that make it stronger and then there are people who want to like um, stay more focused in their attitude towards uh, 
uh, that ritual and that lifetime journey. So they opt for Hajj e Kiran. But majority of us, and what is recommended by Prophet Sallallahu is that you go, you perform your Umrah, and then you're out of Ihram, and then again for the days of Hajj, you are back in that stat status. Right, makes sense, make absolute sense. So now if we talk about the broader aspect of mm -hmm. it, now if we talk about the Hajj rituals in yes. general, and how long do they last for? They actually last from the 8th Zilhijjah till 12th and 13th of Zilhijjah. So that's the basic time frame. And again, some of the aspects which inshallah will cover in due time, uh, they are some other compulsory components without which your Hajj is not complete. And a lot of time when people are training uh, um, the masses on all these rituals, so they do highlight this aspect. Because people who don't attend these trainings or uh, sometimes what they're doing is either they are overindulging in everything and again they're getting exhausted or they're getting sick and a lot of the people they end up in hospitals and then the people have to, the authorities over there, they have to facilitate them for their rituals. And again there are some people who would come back thinking they have performed the whole Hajj and they've missed out some elements. So we need to be very clear that in these days, five, six days that are, we are there, what are the compulsory components that we cannot miss out on any account? What are the sunnas? What are the uh, advisable acts? So that we can categorize and then uh, set our priorities over there as well. And that also guides us that it's not just about rituals. It's about setting your priorities, knowing what to do, when, where, and how. And uh, like making a choice between the two acts. So uh, like you've mentioned that of course there are rituals but they translate into something bigger. Into your, you adopt these kind of traits from performing Hajj and then you inculcate them in, in your life and it certainly makes it better of course. So now if we talk about how to prepare yourself for Hajj, like you've mentioned that there are some compulsory things that are necessary in order to make sure that you are under the category of a Haji. So can you guide us through that? Uh, like you know when we make any journey like these days when people are coming out of this COVID because of the uh, the post vaccination scenario and the peak is uh, gone and so they are like you know trying to come back to the normal lifestyle so what are we doing we may we are making plans for the whole year we are like the vacations and where to go what to do what not to do similarly for Hajj we need to like plan ahead and it's not like a lot of time I've seen when people say uh, very typically that, oh, this is a call from Allah, so Allah will take care of us. Yeah. Yes, indeed, this is call from Allah because there are so many people who uh, really have this desire to go and somehow one way or the other they're not able to make that trip. But after still understanding the concept that, yes, this is call from Allah, we need to have the intention of going and the intention has to be purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not because of some external pressure to be like, you know, since everyone does it in our community or in our setup or I need to have that certain label of being a haji. So that shouldn't be there. Purify your intention that this is something I can afford. I fit into that criterion and this is my priority. So the moment you set your intention, what we advise um, as doctors as well, the three years ahead of your plan, to actually go for your Hajj, you need to work on your stamina. Okay. You need to work on your health basic parameters like if they, you are diabetic or you have hypertension or you have a cardiac disease, whatever ailments you have, you need to be like sort of, you know, having repeated doctor's visits so that you are fit to travel and uh, you are well controlled. In fact, also, I also advise people to run your basic labs uh, three months ahead of time because sometimes uh, there are people who have some disease process, but um, they, they are not aware of it. And they actually understand it the moment they are in a stressful situation, like when they are with masses at the time of Hajj. Then if you need any vaccination, you should be particular about that. Um, you should start walking. Then you should start uh, pulling out some material, reading material on Hajj and Umrah and all the ritual, the spirit of it. Uh, then at the very same time, watch some clips uh, because nowadays we have this facility available that you can understand whatever you have to do. And uh, when it comes to removing your body hair as well, uh, for men I've seen that they shave their head off and uh, for women uh, they cut their hair as well. That, that will happen during the time of Hajj. But uh, when you're going for Hajj, you, you should cut your nails uh, before you make that intention. And if you want to uh, like trim your hair, 
you do that uh, before that time frame. And uh, then there is also specification for men what kind of shoes they can wear. Uh, but you can wear a watch, you can carry a bag, you can wear a, a, a have a phone. Uh, you can, uh, like, you know, there, there's some things which are allowed and there are few things for which you have to be cautious. Um, one important thing that is that when we say that you should not be wearing a perfume and everything, so even nowadays some people what they do is they don't even, when they go there and they are in that status of ahram and they made that intention for hajj, now they are not even washing themselves, they are smelling like anything, they are stinking, but we need to understand that there are so many uh, non-perfumed soaps available and uh, we are recommended to take bath. We can like even in ahram we can take bath. Like yes. you can take it off and then put it on again. So some things that we need to understand because we are there with such a huge crowd and the weather is harsh over there a lot of times because it's a desert. So we need to be very particular about these things. Exactly. I think you've pointed out a very good point because I think these are some of the complaints that I've usually heard from people who have embarked on this journey that, okay, people do not take care of their cleanliness or hygiene. And like you've mentioned that you can actually perform yes, can. Uh, a bath during it as well. And uh, another thing that I liked uh, how you... Uh, how you mentioned that it is very important to take care of your physical health before you're embarking on this journey. And along with that, you need to upgrade yourself with the spiritual aspect of it as well. Learn the duas from the very start. And uh, I think this makes a very, uh, makes a lot of sense because it's now it's a complete package because you're taking care of your health, you're taking care of your spiritual uh, learning as well. So I think when you're embarking on that journey, you will be fully prepared if you do at least one year before you start preparing for Hajj, you have the intention to perform it with absolute energy and absolute devotion. So this is, I think, a great way to start it as well. Another and important thing, Arida, is that uh, sometimes when we read all the do's and don'ts and um, all the narrations by the Prophet ﷺ, this is what you can do, this is something that you cannot do. Because we are living in a different environment back home and some of the things we are not either accustomed to or we don't come across those situations. So uh, we sometimes don't pay much, we don't give much value to those elements and when we land into those areas then we start thinking. Because I ha actually had this one experience when I went for Hajj way back um, and I read this one narration by the Prophet ﷺ that uh, if you have eaten camel meat then you will have to perform your wuzu, your ablution again. Yeah. Um, so I kept thinking why, but then I thought, oh, I'm not going to eat camel meat. Now, when we, I went for Hajj and I realized that in so many places, the shawarma and uh, the sandwiches that you get, uh, it's camel meat because that's very famous over there and people uh, like that. So I sort of avoided eating camel meat. Now, what happened, uh, that was long uh, way back when there was a big fire erupted in, the, in Mina. And we were also in that scenario. Really? Yes, I, Alhamdulillah, we were safe and everything, but there was a big crisis for food and everything. So whatever was available, people were growing and grasping it. And I remember my group, we were standing over there, and the only sandwich that uh, we could get hold of were, have, were, had some meat. And I was constantly asking them, is it camel meat? Is it camel meat? And everyone in my group said, why are you so concerned about it? I said, I read this narration that if we eat camel meat, then we have to perform wuzu again. Uh, I did not know the logic for that. I came back and then I discussed with a couple of scholars and they said because this has been uh, told to us by the Prophet uh, that there is a certain, um, uh, what you say is uh, the um, impact of this camel meat. It is considered to be uh, having that, uh, that kind of a reaction in your body for which it is better to cool yourself down by uh, performing wuzu again. So uh, uh, that, that, is, that was something that I experienced over there. So after that, I always advise people that when you read something, uh, you find out that this is something that you can do, this is something you cannot do, try to place yourself in that environment. And then try to understand all the rituals because you could come across any situation or any scenario where you have to put it into practice. That makes sense. And that is, again, highlights that you should read up. Yes. You should always read up because there's no excuse for ignorance. 
if, even if you hadn't read up you that this was a sunnah this was a command of the prophet and uh, i think you have you would have gained a lot of um, um, blessings just by following it so i think this is a great lesson for all our viewers that one should always read up there is so much material out there there's so many help out there so always reach out always make sure that you have the entire knowledge of what you are about to do what you are embark on mm -hmm. another point that you highlighted was also very important that when you're wearing an ihram you are you feel connected to god because at that moment there's no material aspect to it you're not wearing a brand to show the people to show off to people nothing else matters Why you don't you're need not looking down on people then? exactly and at that moment everybody is equal like you mentioned there are no socio economic standards the rich aren't dressed up in red or the poor aren't dressed up in blue you know there's nothing like that there's no distinction because in the eyes of god everybody is equal and everybody is the same so i think that is also very important and like i i'm conversing with you i'm realizing that the rituals have so much more meaning to it than the actual rituals itself exactly so like in our own lifestyle we look at ourselves oh i am a big shot you know people yeah. recognize me people give me some weightage but when you're standing over there among the crowd you're like i'm just a tiny speck yeah. and it's my deed it's my intention it's my connection with the god which is going to carry me forward yes in this life and the hereafter as well now if we talk about the niya so when you when you think about performing hajj okay the intention and then you actually have the opportunity the calling to perform the hajj so is there any specific kind of niyat that you have to do in order to move forward with it actually people sometimes have this specific words but um, niya if you ask me is uh, that state of your heart and mind that's like your heart and mind connection it's a thought process it's not like actual wording in fact i have often seen people asking each other okay what are the exact word that we should be uh, setting out for but i i still recall that uh, very beautifully some of the experts who were training us for hajj they said uh, you can tell yourself when you are even in the thought process even in your heart i'm making an intention for hajj or i'm making this intention for umrah uh, and i'm making it solely for so this intention solely for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala allah please make it easy for me and also help me perform it so that uh, i bring in your pleasure so i i found it beautiful like you don't have to actually have very specific words but at least you can think about it this way that i have to put in my best and i have to be performing it according to the right standard like uh, we are walking through it right yeah. so now you've landed in the airport and now you're heading towards the destination and when you're starting the holy pilgrimage so what is the first thing that you do what is the first thing that you do that commemorates your start of hajj first thing is uh, your uh, like you should be in your ihram and um nowadays like you know we have air travel and there is a specific spot which is known as miqat and miqat is there are five boundaries which have been defined world over and we can read it from the books as well and these are the spots after which if you have not made beyond which like if you have not made your in, uh, this intention of hajj then uh, it's not valid like your trip is not valid that way for hajj so before you hit miqat you have to make that intention now uh, when you're having an air travel a uh, lot of time people say that sometime your flight could be um, delayed for some reason so uh, i have seen people like when they start from their home they make that take that intention that i'm in my ihram and sometimes they have to be at airport for hours and hours and it gets really exhausting yeah. so some experts say that what you can do is you can wear your ihram if you feel that it will be difficult for you to change uh, at the airport but don't make that intention uh, right. just before uh, like your flight time is announced and you are about to board that's when you can take that intention even like if you are uh, traveling through sea or some uh, traveling through by road again you can keep check on miqat and on that spot you can make the intention Uh, we have actually also seen in the uh, this uh, a flight that sometimes they do announce if you especially tell them that if you announce the miqat they, they do tell you that now we are approaching that spot now you can make that intention so you make that intention over there and then you start making your duas and the most important dua that you make is when you um, these are the dua specified duas that you make and you will often hear these hajis they will be uh, making those dua when we say labbaik allahumma labbaik yes. 
that uh, that that's like a very beautiful dua that we make that oh Allah I'm here I'm there on your call I'm your servant and I'm approaching you and like you know we are uh, submitting to him and it is so beautiful like you hear people making that dua and repeatedly they are talking about that it's a beautiful feel so it was indeed beautiful and chilling I think I have goosebumps again just by thinking about it and listening to it as well so Talbiya is I think I wanted to ask you what is what was your favorite part of the whole rituals when you were on the journey to Hajj? I think every uh, ritual that uh, came across had a special feel about it yes. and um, everything made me contemplate and like you know look into the purpose of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do a certain thing and why he has chosen not Switzerland but a barren land for uh, his uh, ibadah. I mean he could have placed his house in the most beautiful spot on the earth but he chose that total barren and desert land with the harsh weather conditions. So everything makes you think uh, and ponder that where my focus should be and um, I, I think I basically enjoyed everything. Every aspect. Every, of every it. aspect and because everything had a certain uh, connection and so I like to like remind myself of that connection. That is beautiful. Everything had its own special feel and its own special connection like you've mentioned. Now if we talk about uh, towards the end, I think it's very important to talk about the state of Ihram and what one should do while they're in that state. Um, again, we need to understand that there are certain things we can do and there are certain things that we should be stopping ourselves from. So when it comes to the list of things we can do, we can take a bath. That is like the most important yes. thing and I put it on the top priority. Um, you can even scratch your body and hair because sometimes when we say that you should not be pulling your hair or uh, you should not be hurting anyone. So people are like so extra cautious about even scratching, even combing or even like doing something which can be done. Um, then if there is a wound, you have a wound or you hurt yourself so you can go for a dress. Um, then you know sometimes like you can have a scratch or you can have a wound. Uh, so if you need a dressing or need to apply something, you can do it even in that state of ahram. Um, applying any medication uh, which is obviously not perfumed is allowed. Uh, then uh, killing any animal, any insect which is dangerous because otherwise we are not allowed to hunt or we are not allowed to uh, like go for anything which is sort of a um, entertainment kind of an activity for us. But if you find anything which is hurtful, you can kill that uh, insect. Uh, then you can change the sheets of ahram like because if you are constantly wearing them and you feel something is dirty so you can take extra sheets with you and you can always change them. Uh, you can wear a ring, you can wear glasses, um, you can hold an umbrella, you can use oil or soap which is obviously not perfumed. Uh, you can hunt for sea animals. Uh, and also uh, if there is somebody with you like sometime when families go and your kid is doing something which is not right and you have to reprimand them obviously you shouldn't be shouting screaming or beating anyone but uh, you can tell them you can warn them firmly that this is something that you shouldn't be doing because again we have extremes people who would be extra polite on everything and they wouldn't follow any rulings and then there are people who would go harsh you would find people fighting and picking on things that I want to perform my Hajj and I want to be in the first row or I want the bus to immediately start going, we are missing our prayer. So these are the elements which make people very impatient and we should refrain from it. Right, makes sense. And what are the things that are forbidden? I think you kind of covered everything yeah. up but still. Fighting. Fighting. Uh, this is something that we need to be really working on and I usually advise people that we need to work on our uh, stress management a lot before we go for Hajj because if we are uh, not able to tolerate one or two people around us then what will we do when there is a big huge crowd uh, coming from different countries, different backgrounds and you know they're following their own things. Uh, another thing is that, that uh, intimacy relationship between husband and wife, that has to be stopped. That shouldn't be there in the state of, uh, of Aram. Then any kind of sin, then not applying any perfume. Um, then even like killing any animal other than the sacrifice that we will be making. Um, also cutting off your hair apart from where it has been uh, specifically told as a ritual. Uh, not on, also like trimming your nails. Uh, and also not um, cutting the trees 
or uh, picking up the fruits from the trees. So anything like that is forbidden. Right, makes sense, absolutely. And lastly, uh, just a quick question that I want to uh, address is that if you somehow, because we're all humans at the end of the day, if you somehow make a mistake uh, while performing the Hajj, if you do not, you know, do something that is according to the teachings. So are there any way you can reprehend yourself? Uh, is there any way to make sure that uh, you try to fix what you've uh, wronged? We always understand uh, and the important thing is that uh, if, uh, if you make unintentional mistake, uh, you're not even sure about it, then this is something that uh, we don't have to pay any heed to, like we shouldn't be overly concerned about it. But if you did something intentionally and then you realized it that I shouldn't have done it, so again, uh, there's a list that you can find in the books, but we have been told uh, for a major thing that you missed out, you have to sacrifice an extra animal or you have to uh, uh, like feed six people or fast for three days. Um, and again, what we can do is uh, the beauty of uh, uh, whatever, whenever you are stuck in a certain situation is that there are multiple scholars over there, multiple booths over there, multiple people over there who can guide you. So you can always take your question to them that this is something that I have faced. Uh, so what can I do now? So they will be able to guide you better. Right. So rather than like staying in that uh, sort yeah. of a guilt and misery and in a question mark state, so go, reach yes, reach out, find the answer and be at peace. Right. right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaval Kaise. It was very informative and very in detail about the Hajj rituals. I hope all of you learned a great deal from it and will bring you more episodes and more uh, such episodes that will explain the technicalities of the aspect as well and help you better understand this important fifth pillar of Islam. Till then, this is your host, Rida Shah, bidding you farewell. <laughs> Sallim da'im.